Well, good evening. It's good to see everyone tonight. Hope everyone's had a good day today. As I've stated each month leading into these question and answer sessions, I appreciate so much the questions that have been submitted and encourage you to continue to submit questions. I have enough for probably about two more sessions, and so if you have questions that you would like to have answered, please submit those to me. Let's get right into the lesson tonight, into these questions. Question number one, will the earth pass away at the same moment that we meet the Lord in the air? Well, in order to establish the proper setting to answer this question, there's a couple of passages that we need to examine. First, if you would, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. Paul writes, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. This passage reveals to us that when Jesus comes again, the dead in Christ, those who have lived faithful Christian lives but have suffered physical death prior to His coming, that they will rise from their graves first. They will rise in this incorruptible form. They will rise to meet the Lord in the air. But then, after this has taken place, those who are alive and remain, those who are still alive physically at that time, then they will rise to meet the Lord in the air, and they will all go to stand in judgment. And while this gives us a picture of what is going to happen to the soul when Jesus comes again, it does not tell us what's going to happen to this earth, this present reality, when that last day comes. For that, we need to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The heavens this is talking about here is the atmosphere, outer space, this reality that we are able to look into the sky and see. The heavens will melt away. They will be destroyed with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So we see that on the same day that Jesus comes to take our souls to stand in judgment, that this present reality is going to come to an end. This present reality is going to be destroyed by fire. But these two passages do not tell us anything about the timeline, about the succession of how these things are actually going to happen. In fact, the only passage that we find in the New Testament that says anything whatsoever about the timing of the day of judgment is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. For in this passage, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. I'm going to tell you something that's not been revealed before. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Therefore, we can deduce from what this passage tells us that when Jesus comes again, it's going to be sudden. It's going to happen very quickly in quick succession. We're going to be changed in in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And whenever we think about that, We're told that it takes less than half a second to blink the eyes. And what is going to take place on the Day of Judgment is going to happen faster than that. These things are going to happen in such rapid succession that we will not be able to comprehend exactly what is transpiring. All we're going to know is that Jesus is here. 
Jesus is here, we are being changed, and we are going to stand before Him. Now, nothing in the Scriptures tell us exactly when the earth is going to be destroyed in retrospect to the rising of our souls to go stand in judgment. But we can deduce logically from the things that we read here that it's going to be in fairly quick succession. It's going to take place on this last day. The earth and all the elements of the earth, the heavens and the elements of the heavens, they're all going to be destroyed by fire. It's going to happen on the same day that Jesus comes to receive our souls to take us to stand in judgment. But exactly the succession of when that's going to happen, the Scriptures do not tell us. There's one area of thought that says that as soon as we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, that everything at that point is just going to be destroyed. There's another view that says that we will actually be in heaven or be there in that waiting place waiting to be judged before all of these things are destroyed. We can't say one way or the other. It would be assuming on our part to say which of these is the case. But what we do know is that it is going to take place on the same day. The same day that we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the same day that Jesus comes again with a shout of the archangel, with the trump of God, the earth is going to be destroyed on that same day. Question number two. In John 6 and verse 40, please explain the statement, I will raise him up at the last day. Well, we need to look at the full context of this chapter in order to understand the meaning of this statement. So we're going to back up to John 6 and verse 35. We're going to read down through verse 48. It says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said to you that ye have also seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will that hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at Him because He said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that He saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves, No man can come to me except the Father, which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught, or all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He, excuse me, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, hath everlasting life, I am the bread of life. Three times in this passage that I just shared with you, Jesus makes this statement, that I will raise him up at the last day. We find one other place further on down in this chapter in verse 54 where this statement is mentioned for a fourth time. Well, looking at this context, Jesus refers to himself as the bread of life. And in this, he is drawing attention Uh, of the listeners to this concept of physical nourishment. We have to understand that what has taken place just prior to this is the feeding of the 5,000. He took these loaves and these two two fishes and he was able to feed 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. And then he uses this as an illustration to show that while that provided physical nourishment that what he had to provide to them was spiritual nourishment. And so whenever we acknowledge what he is talking about here, he's saying that just as physical nourishment is crucial to the survival of the physical body, spiritual nourishment is crucial to the survival of the soul. 
And looking at this, he's drawing their attention back to uh, the time of the wilderness wandering. You remember when God caused the manna to rain down from heaven each day except for the Sabbath? This was a form of bread. And he is calling their attention back to this concept of that being the physical bread of life that God had provided for them. But now God has sent the spiritual bread of life. He has sent His Son to earth. And that through our obedience to Him, that we will be, as this question says, raised up on the last day. So now let's think about this question. What does Jesus mean? What's He talking about when He says, I will raise Him up at the last day? Folks, He's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about, going back to the question that we just saw before, when He comes again. Those who are faithful to Christ, those who have passed away in a faithful state, they're going to rise first. They're going to have on this incorruptible form, this new body that we talked about in the lesson this morning, this perfect, immortal body. And then those who are alive and remain, those who are still alive in the flesh, they will be changed. They will take on this incorruptible body because only that which is incorruptible can go to the place where God is. And so when Jesus says that I will raise Him up on the last day, He is saying those that accept, those that take into themselves the things that Jesus has to provide from a spiritual point of view, He will raise them up to glory on the last day. Question number three. Were there two women named Mary who anointed Jesus' feet and dried, or anointed Jesus' feet and dried his feet with her hair? And the references that we have are John the twelfth chapter and verse three and Luke the seventh chapter verses thirty seven and thirty eight. Well, let's start out by looking at John's account. John twelve, beginning in verse two, we find this account. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment." Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying hath she kept this, for the poor always ye have with you. But me, you have not always. So on this occasion, Jesus is in the city of Bethany. He's visiting in the home of friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. During this meal, Jesus and Lazarus, they are seated at the table. Martha is busy. She's serving the meal. But then Martha, or Mary, she does something that the disciples, at least Judas, saw as just completely out of line. It says that she goes and she retrieves a vial, or as it says here, a pound of oil or ointment of spikenard. She brings it over. She washes the feet of Jesus. She dries his feet with her hair. She places this ointment upon his feet. And then she dries the wetness of the ointment from his feet with her hair. Now just kind of on a side note, Spikenard was the most expensive perfume that was available in the first century. One pound of spikenard. If you notice in the text that we saw here, Judas says that it could be sold for 300 pence. Putting this into um, an English uh, currency conversion. One pound of oil of spikenard would cost roughly a year's wages. And I've saw different references that say in U.S. dollars, this perfume, the amount that she used on Jesus' feet, would have cost today anywhere between twenty to $40,000. Now 
Now, does that kind of open your eyes a little bit to why Judas did what he did? Why he said what he said? He saw this as being something that was very wasteful. He saw this as being unnecessary. Why did she do this? Why would she waste something that was so precious? Why would she put that on Jesus' feet? He said, we could have taken that, we could have sold it, we could have gone out and helped the poor. Well, the text says he wasn't really interested in the poor, but he was the one that was carrying the money. He was interested in having that. He was a thief. But Jesus calls him out, corrects this behavior that he exhibited against Mary. The other account that we find is in Luke chapter 7. It's verses 36 through 50, and we're not going to read this whole passage, but we're going to refer to several verses from it. Here Jesus is invited into the home of one of the Pharisees, a man by the name of Simon. Well, while they are there, they're reclined at the table, which was the common fashion that people would uh, sit around a table during those days. And while they were there eating, a woman, the text simply says, a woman. She came into the place where Jesus was. She came up behind him and she was weeping very strongly. Weeping so much that she was wetting Jesus' feet with her tears. But when she saw what was taking place... She bent down, she dried the tears off of his feet. And the text says that she took out an alabaster flask of oil. Now, what this was, we do not know. Due to her lifestyle, more than likely this would not have been the same kind of costly ointment that we see with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But regardless of what it was, she takes out this flask of ointment. She breaks it. She pours it onto Jesus' feet. But she does this as a sign of respect. But due to the lifestyle of this woman, Simon is appalled by what's taking place. She has come up into his house. She has disrupted his dinner party. He did not see her as being someone that was worthy to be there in the presence of Jesus, much less to be in the home of a high-standing Jew. And so he calls out Jesus. He says, why, why are you letting her do this? Do you not know who she is? Do you not know the kind of lifestyle that she lives? And Jesus uses this opportunity to teach Simon and all of those gathered there a very powerful lesson on forgiveness and essentially who forgiveness means more to. And he says, those that have had more forgiven, it means more to them than the one that has had little forgiven. Okay, now these two stories have some similarities, don't they? And while they have some similarities, we find that there are some marked differences in these two stories. First, John's account took place in the city of Bethany, which was in the region of Judea. According to the text, what we read in Luke's account took place somewhere in Galilee. This was where Jesus was engaged in ministry at that time. Second, in John's account, we have the woman mentioned by name. This was Mary. We know about Mary. We read about Mary in other places. She was the sister of Martha and of Lazarus. Remember, at this time, it's after Jesus had already brought Lazarus back from the dead. They were close friends. They knew each other well. Third, in John's account, Mary was a faithful disciple of Jesus. But the woman in Luke's story, she was living a life of sin. Mary anointed Jesus' feet as a foreshadowing of his death. The woman in Luke's account did so as a sign of honor and respect to Jesus. So in answer to this question, it is possible that both of these women had the name of Mary. But Luke's account does not tell us what this woman's name was. Now there are some that believe that this was Mary Magdalene. There are some that believe that due to uh, Jesus casting seven devils out of her, it indicated that she had lived a life of sin and that she is the one that was in this account. Folks, the text doesn't tell us that. That is tradition that was uh, developed by man. That does not have any scriptural basis whatsoever. John's account, we know that this woman was Mary, the, the, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. But who this woman was in Luke's account, the text does not tell us anything other than she was a sinner 
who Jesus forgave. Verse 4. And this is an interesting question, at least in my opinion. What happened to the souls of the saints who came forth from their tombs in Matthew 27, 52 through 53? Well, folks, here is the short answer. They died again. They died again. But I want you to notice the text in question. It says, and this is talking about in the crucifixion account of Jesus, it says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Folks, this miracle took place for the same reason. That life was restored to Lazarus. Life was restored to the son of the widow of Nain. Life was restored to Jairus' daughter. It was to prove Jesus' power over death. In each of these instances, physical life was what was restored. It does not say that they were restored to any type of immortality. It does not say that it was simply the physical body that came back, but the soul was not restored to the body, such much as like what we would say in our culture today, a zombie or something like that. It wasn't anything like that. Physical life was restored to these individuals. But in each of these cases, because it was physical life that was restored to them, physical death took place again. From the time that man was driven out of the Garden of Eden, they were told that part of their lot in life was to eventually reach the point where they would pass away, where they would die physically. And as we mentioned in our lesson this morning, there were only two people that we read about in the Scriptures that never uh, experienced physical death. They were Enoch and Elijah. Everyone else has faced that. Those of us that are alive today, unless we are still alive when Jesus comes again, we will all have that experience of facing physical death. But I want you to notice what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 20. It says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Then come at the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. This tells us that until Jesus comes again, that we have an enemy in the flesh that all of us are not able to conquer. Death. But when Jesus comes again, and He restores life to those who have passed away. When they come forth from the tomb, when we're changed into that spiritual form, He is proving once and for all, He's the first fruits of those that are changed. The first fruits of those who are, uh, who, who are changed into this spiritual form. He says, but each one, each one that are Christ at His coming, when Jesus comes again, those faithful dead, those who are alive, who are faithful at that time, then they will receive that eternal life in heaven. They will take on that immortal body. They'll have access to the tree of life, as we read this morning, that's there on either side of the river that flows through the street there in heaven. They'll have access to that. Therefore, since those saints that came forth from the tomb in Matthew 27 were mortal men. One day they reached the point that they did die again. They faced physical death again. But when Jesus comes again, and all in their graves shall come forth to face the judgment, as he says, the last enemy of man, this physical death, will be destroyed. 
and the faithful will live on forever in the presence of the Lord. And then lastly tonight, question number five. What does it mean in Matthew 27 and verse 50 when it says Jesus yielded up the ghost? Now in this verse, the King James Version says Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Now there are several modern English translations that render it this way. Again, Jesus cried out loudly and then he died. While in my opinion, these modern translations do not convey the full gravity of what took place. The overall message is the same. Jesus cried out and he died. But consider this. People die every day. But not everybody yields to death. Think about that. To yield means to give way to arguments, demands, or pressure. And due to the pressure that our sins placed upon Jesus, He yielded up His soul willingly to God. He willingly laid down His life so that we could have the forgiveness of our sins. Now, had he fought against this? Had he argued with God? Had he said, no, I'm not going to go through with this. I'm not going to allow this to happen. Had he fought with the Romans trying to prevent this? Could we say that he yielded up his spirit? No, we couldn't say that. Even if they did ultimately get him on that cross. Even if they did ultimately put him to death. Even if he did ultimately die. Could we say he yielded up the Spirit? No. We could not say that at all. Jesus willingly gave up his life. And this is why I believe that the King James rendering of this is a little bit more descriptive, a little bit more powerful in uh, describing exactly what took place on that occasion. Now, let me address this concept of the difference in ghosts and spirits. A ghost is defined as a disembodied spirit that reveals itself to the living. This concept is one that is unscriptural. Because Luke chapter 16 tells us that when we depart from this life, what happens to the soul? He goes to one of two places, doesn't it? It goes to paradise or it goes to torment. Folks, it does not stick around to haunt people we don't like. It doesn't stick around and live in the home where we've lived for many years because that place is dear to us or because we have some form of unfinished business. Scriptures tell us that when we die, the soul moves on. The soul goes on to either paradise or to torment. Now, what about a spirit? Folks, spirits are that part of each and every one of us that lives on after death. It is that eternal aspect that is a part of each of our lives. That part that when we pass away, that part goes back to God who gave it to us. And this spirit is what will be judged and either rewarded or punished. But then the question often arises, well, why does the King James Version then say that Jesus gave up the ghost? Well, folks, it's simply because in 1611 when the King James Version was translated, they didn't have the proper understanding of what Matthew was saying here. We have to understand that over time, folks, we're talking about hundreds of years. Words change meaning. But what we find is that Jesus willingly died on the cross for us. He yielded up His Spirit. His Spirit went to be with God. Remember, He told the thief on the cross, This day you will be with me in paradise. And Jesus was in paradise until He came forth from the grave on the third day. And then He ascended into heaven 
where he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus yielded up his spirit. Tonight, if there's anyone here who you examine yourself and you find that as a child of God, there's things in your life that you need help with. There are things that are of a sinful nature that you need to repent of or that you've strayed away from the faith and you need to be restored, then we would encourage you to come forward and make those things known. Let us go to the Father in prayer on your behalf. Or maybe there's someone here tonight who has never obeyed the gospel. Tonight, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then we would encourage you to follow what He has commanded us to do in order to become a child of God. We must repent of our sins. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then we must be willing to confess Christ. Jesus said, if you confess my name before men, I will confess your name before my Father which is in heaven. And we must be baptized into Christ. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Tonight, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come while we stand and sing.